Welcome to lecture 18. Uh, today we'll be covering lessons learned in the design analysis of aerospace structures, and we'll be doing this with Dr. Ivaturi Iv Raju, who is a retired NASA technical fellow and who has actually been my mentor over the years as well. Uh, he's, he's developed uh, uh, a lot of advances in the fraction mechanics arena that are, are quite used. Um, and so, uh, with that said, um, we, we, we've been talking about in this class quite a bit, uh, aircraft design requires developing methods to design, analyze, and manufacture an aircraft with a high level of confidence. Uh, if anything goes incorrectly in the analysis or the test, w we could uh, have a potential issue. That's also true for launch vehicle design. And so one of the things that we've been talking about a, a lot in this course is how the analysis has to go along very well with the testing, how that goes hand in hand, because when you fly something and you test something, there'll be a difference in how the stress is behaving. So you have to come up with a good test program that can envelope the analysis. And so analysis plays a huge role, a very important role. And for that, for that reason, uh, it's, it's on you to, to, to pause this video or even take a moment right now and download this particular paper, uh, which is called the Sum of Observations on the Current Status of Performing Finite Element Analysis, which was a paper written by Dr. Raju, who we have invited today. And that paper is the AIAA 2015-2070. And you should have full access to this paper through VPN. And I recommend highly that you go through that. I'll be also posting this presentation for your understanding and I think the reason it's important for you to learn about what's written here is because, again, finite element analysis plays a critical role in sizing your test program, the test article, and also is going to help you develop the transfer function between test and flight. We want to make sure that your test is test like your flight. That's why analysis becomes so important. And also, it will help you later to make sure your structure is qualified and that when you have non-conformances, say somebody creates the fuselage thicknesses smaller than intended, you can then use the validated analysis techniques to then assess the structure. And so here are some pictures from the presentation that Dr. Raju provided me. And really what I'm trying to show here is examples. Here is uh, this, this particular problem here is the air, aircraft empennage. And this here was a, a study that was done to support a failure investigation, an American Airlines crash investigation. And Dr. Raju actually, with his team, wrote a paper that won the best paper award at the AIAA conference. And I think it's one of those papers that you want to download and read and learn about. Uh, and one of the things we'll be talking about later today is the importance of using global local models to create mesh refinement in areas where you need them and keeping a coarse mesh density in areas where you do, not, you do not need them. And so here at the bottom, uh, we're also showing the crew module, uh, which is uh, another structure that people are analyzing. And the bottom line here is that you want to create finite element analysis in a smart way. And here again, uh, a zoom in of uh, a abacus local model trying to simulate that global behavior. So let me introduce you now to uh, Dr. Raju. He's a retired NASA technical fellow uh, with extensive experience. He has been working in the fields of fracture, structural mechanics at the Langley Research Center at NASA since 1975. In 1994, he was selected as the branch head of the mechanics of materials branch in the materials division. And that division was really developing methodologies to characterize and predict and improve durability and damage tolerance of metallic and composite materials. Now, when I talk about NASA here, the work they were doing was instrumental and is heavily used in the aircraft industry. While it's called NASA, NASA also works quite a bit, not just on launch vehicles and spacecraft, but they also work in the aeronautics arena. And so the work, that Dr. Raju performed was instrumental and continues to be instrumental today. 
the codes I used today use some of the formulas he developed for fracture mechanics. And so he's not, you know, he just retired uh, as the NASA NESC or NASA Technical Fellow, and he's worked at the NASA NESC, uh, and he uh, has a program management experience, uh, and he has just just a breadth of experience and knowledge. And I, I'm very excited and honored to, to have him here. You should be honored to be here as well, uh, and we should all listen to what he has to say today. So with that said, over to you, Dr. Raju. Thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Gore. Thank you for inviting me to your class. Uh, <clears throat> can I move to the next chart? Yeah. <clears throat> I have about five charts which summarize what I wanted to say. And please stop me if you don't like what I say. <clears throat> Uh, these are uh, these are uh, the top ten lessons learned from. Uh, we actually had a uh, NESC Academy uh, structures course. Uh, a whole lot of people put got together and we put together a course. In that, all the graybeards came up with these ten lessons. Uh, so these are for all analysts. Uh, most of them are for uh, young people like you. Uh, the first lesson is don't be deceived. Don't confuse knowing how to run a code like Nastran or Abacus to, with knowing what the code does. There are two different things and uh, uh, you need to actually know how, what the code does. You need to dig deep into that. Uh, bigger is not always better. Just because you have a million degrees of freedom, don't assume that you are going to get the right answer. Okay, uh, I will I will come to this point later on as well. Uh, be sure your results make common sense. <clears throat> you know, just because they run to completion doesn't mean it is they are correct. You know, if the load, the maximum deflection should be under the load which you are applying. It cannot be someplace else. You know, and your boundary conditions need to be satisfied when you get the solution. And don't miss the obvious, even if it is not your job. Okay, uh, you will learn about this later on in your life, but that's what's uh, uh, that is one of the lessons. Little things are important. Some of trivia is not trivial. You have to take care of small things. Okay, uh, I will get to this again at the end of the this presentation. And one size doesn't fit all. One final element mesh you make, or one analysis you make, you perform for a simple problem. Uh, is not going to fit for another problem. Anticipate that you have to make different models each time you are working a problem. You have to understand the sensitivity of your models and the results to parametric variations and problem uncertainties. First, identify the parametric variations what you have and the problem uncertainties. And then uh, you, you try with various values and see what your model does. Test cases do not always tell the full story. Know what you do not do know and understand what you do not know. Okay, uh, this is self-explanatory. Things come around. Plan your analysis and document your processes and results. You know, yeah, just because you have completed an analysis, don't throw the final element model away. You probably will need it in the next couple of months. Somebody will come back and say, I'm not getting the same answer of yes, what you got. So how do you explain that? And number 10, uh, it got a little, uh, uh, it got a little chopped, but be the harshest critic of your own simulations. If you don't believe them, why should anybody else? So actually I always tell uh, my young people, my young uh, colleagues, that when you get a final element solution back from the computer, your first null hypothesis is that everything is wrong. In the next 30 minutes, you have to prove that your null hypothesis is wrong. You go and prove every time saying that this is correct, this is correct, this is correct. I prescribe these boundary conditions and they are coming out same. I prescribe these loadings. The total load is, is exactly same and so on. 
Okay, can I have the next chapter? So, so, Dr. Raju, is it true that if we don't pay attention to the things you're saying, those things can contribute to flight anomalies? Those things, what? Those things, uh, those things can, can contribute to flight anomalies. You yes, can have they contribute to flight anomalies. I actually give you examples of that later on. Yeah, yeah, they do, they do. And here are some guidelines uh, uh, which the general purpose program guys like NASTRA and ANSYS, uh, Abacus, all these guys actually give these uh, uh, in their websites. Most final element packages have element distortion checks and will warn the user if the, if the elements exceed those limits, okay? The triangle is not, is, is a, uh, has a, uh, is, is very ill-formed, so to speak. Check element normals. All normals need to point in the same directions to ensure proper nodal numbering. Use shrink plot to check the connectivities of missing elements. Okay, the first three, uh, I do not know how much they are useful now. They were useful 15 years ago, 10 years ago, when we did not have automatic mesh generators. You guys have automatic mesh generators now, and th therefore all of these, uh, most probably all of these need not be checked because they're already checked by the, by the softwares. Okay, number four, apply a dummy load which will exercise all components of the model to make sure that there is nothing wrong in the model. Add density and perform a free-free model analysis. When you do a free-free model analysis, there, is, there, are a, there are a couple of issues with this. You all know that the stiffness matrix is, uh, is always singular, right? Uh, so the assembled stiffness matrix of a free-free beam or a free-free structure is singular. You cannot invert a singular matrix, but still you have to find the eigenvalues of, uh, of K minus one M. We obviously cannot invert, invert the stiffness matrix. So what we do in a free-free analysis is we invert the mass matrix. You do M minus one K and obtain the eigenvalues of that. And that's how you do the model analysis. Okay, uh, so you keep that in mind uh, when you do a nonlinear analysis. Impose full load and solve the problem as a nonlinear system. You may not, at this point in, in your career, you may not be able to do this, but that's what we should do uh, to make sure that there are no, uh, that the linear solution what you obtained is in fact correct. Develop your own repository of element test cases. Suit uh, a suite of example problems for your applications. Uh, this is a very important uh, uh, suggestion, uh, advice, a guideline, which the manufacturer is telling you that if you are, if you really want to work for the rest of your career in NASTRAN, you know, ANSYS or Abacus, stick to the software and <clears throat> develop your own uh, sample problems, suite of example problems, and see how the software performs. You have already known solutions for these problems. So you compare how, how your uh, uh, software performs in these things. And there is an excellent paper uh, uh, written by McNeil Harder. McNeil was the, uh, was the chief architect of NASTRAN when it started. Richard McNeil, he passed away a couple of, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, McNeil Harder uh, test problems. I can send uh, when I uh, the, the reference, okay? Next chart, please. <clears throat> More observations. Uh, okay, this, uh, um, these are some of the, uh, some of the things that are happening today. Significant advances in modeling and simulation. In the last 10 years, we saw significant advances. We can now do uh, uh, structures, uh, thermal, aero, uh, uh, Etc. All all disciplines can come together and work the problem. We were not able to do that previously. Now we are able to do that because of new finite element software tools and very powerful computers. All these advancements and improvements are providing us opportunities 
to develop really, really complex finite element problem models and interrogate designs and rapidly and accurately. Previously, if you want to develop a finite element model, we, it used to take us like six months or so, okay? Because of the mass generators these days, you can develop a, a finite element, complex finite element model with stiffeners, uh, cutouts and so on, just like the models which uh, uh, Dr. Goyle showed uh, previously. Uh, and then you can, you can run the model and the model would run uh, in a couple of hours if, if the model is very large. Okay, previously 10 years ago, it would have taken us days to get uh, uh, to, to run that uh, the same case. <clears throat> Many uh, early career engineers like you are very proficient in using modern computers and uh, meshing complex 3D configurations and building sophisticated models very quickly and visualizing the results, which is excellent. You should continue to, to hone those skills and uh, become a, a guru in those things. That's very good. That's your, uh, 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 that, that, that's what gets you to the next level of bigger jobs and better jobs. However, there's a blind acceptance. This is another problem with this. When the technology moves forward, something else goes wrong. The blind acceptance of results and issues relative to the quality of interpretation of the results. Most of the time, what we found is the early career engineers do not know what to expect. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you have uh, uh, taken a course on theory of elasticity and uh, plates and shells and, and so on. If you have, if you have uh, studied theory of elasticity, Timoshenko and Goodyear's theory of elasticity, you would know what I'm talking about. Uh, elasticity is a, is a situation in which you have to know the answer before you get it. And it is the intuition of these uh, elasticians is what is, what is astounding. If you, if you look at Tereshenko, you started torsion in chapter five or so. If you want to read that, read that and you wanted to get a quickly, you want to get a grasp of this, Timoshenko will not allow you to do that. You are in article 200 or so. And before you know it, as you are reading it, he will say, as we have seen in article 100. So you go to article 100. Then in article 100, he will say, as I showed you in article 46. So you go to 46. Before you know, you are in article 1. So Timoshenko superposes all of this, all of these things which he, which he previously uh, worked out and then puts together this uh, answer and it satisfies all the equations. And that is the exact solution. How did he get it? It is that intuition uh, uh, elasticians had and we, we, we fortunately, we don't need that when you are doing finite element analysis, but it, it is always helpful to know what is the answer we are expecting, right? And uh, that is the most important thing you need to learn Many of the pit, pitfalls we observed by the early career engineers is putting together the proper boundary and interface conditions. And then when you have plate and shell interfaces, how do you, how do you make the interface? And when you have singularities like crack tips, how do you handle singularities? And the connector modeling, when you are connecting to two different uh, uh, pieces of structure improper use of primary and secondary variable results and linear and nonlinear analysis, inertia relief methods are frequently observed. Okay, let's go to the next one. <clears throat> okay, here is uh, the last but one chart. Uh, analysts need to study software developers manuals. Okay, this you would have known that I am coming to this. If you are working with NASTRAND, you have to go and read their theory manuals, what they are talking about. And uh, uh, similar to ANSYS and similar to Abacus uh, and so on. And actively pursue verification and validation of finite element models. Experiment with various elements to develop their own library of elements and report card test cases. The most important thing is verification and validation. What does verification mean? 
That means after you did the modeling, you want to make sure that all the elements are connected properly. There are no holes in the elements, just like as I pointed previously. And the loads are applied exactly as what you wanted. The boundary conditions are set up properly and your model uh, conforms to the, the actual structure configuration which you are trying to model. That is verification. That means there is a, there is a chance that you will get an answer from this, from this model. And then after you analyze the, after you got the solution, you, you need to take the solution and do a validation. Validation is what? Validation is always with respect to a test. Can you do a test? And can you correlate your analysis results with the test results? In fact, when we are doing a big, uh, a full-scale wing test, right? Full-scale wing test we used to do. And in which case, the, all the analysis is done previously, okay? And all the, there are a battery of 30 or 40 analysts uh, looking at uh, uh, the strain gauge results at each location. And they, they already plotted the analysis result. And they are now plotting the, the result as the loading is being done from the strain gauges. And they need to track properly. If, if they're not tracking properly in, in certain region, then an alarm goes up and say, we are not tracking the, the strain gauge and analysis result here. It happened many times to us because the loading situation, the, the loading uh, situation was not correctly uh, implemented in the, in the test. So we had to stop the, stop the test and go back and rework the, rework the uh, loading, loading uh, pattern and so on. So the validation of the, of the model is very important. They go hand in hand. Uh, and analysts need to be their worst critic. As I said, when, they, when the result comes, you first say that my result is screwed up. You to, and my null hypothesis is this answer is wrong. You go and prove in the next 30 minutes or 40 minutes or one hour that, uh, that uh, your analysis is in fact correct. The general results support the conclusions and they are not just arm waving and explanations. <clears throat> Senior engineers, this is not for you, but for people like uh, Dr. Goyal. Senior engineers and educators need to ensure that the junior engineers receive proper grounding in classical methods. So what I'm talking about, the, the uh, theory of elasticity, finite element theory, yet simple, yet bounding models. Can you make a simple model and then do a hand calculation and show the, those hand calculation techniques and methods for evaluating finite element results? Senior engineers need to invest time. There is not a, this is not an easy job, but you have to invest time mentoring junior engineers. Teach the best practices and teach them the tricks of the analysis trade. Teach them processes to evaluate their finite element results before they can accept them. Okay, we have tried to do that in our, in our all, all my time at, uh, at Langley. And uh, we actually developed a lot of uh, young, very smart people who are now taking over what I was doing. And I have the next one, please. I was gonna comment that it's also important for, the, for you guys okay. yeah. to be open to learning. Uh, sometimes when you're using these tools, you feel like you're very super powerful and you don't want to listen to the senior engineers who are telling <laughs> you, hey, you know, th these things are not going to work out. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's good for you to keep an open mind. You may not agree with them, yeah. but it's good to keep an open mind. Exactly. Exactly. Very well said. Okay. This is the, this is my last chart. This is a, a chart which will be useful for you 20 years from now. Okay. Why do I say that? This is a, these are lessons for the, uh, the mid-career engineers, okay? The mid-career engineers need to be uh, told uh, several times that all analysis and all tests are just models of reality. They're not, they're not real, they're just models, okay? We make a model to be able to predict what's going to happen next, right? And so they are limited and they, uh, they're limited and are models of approximations to real life. 
a lot of us forget that along the along the and and say whatever we did is the correct model correct thing it is not so we we got burnt many times on that and uh, everybody has opinions and beliefs right everybody is entitled to have opinions and beliefs that's fine but when you are in a, a technical meeting or something when you are debating a a, a problem uh, individual opinions and beliefs uh, do not have a uh, role there at nsc we used to say in god we trust but all others bring data okay if you have a opinion if you have a belief okay we we respect that come and discuss with us but bring all the data which you have and let us examine what what this is all about and if we if we agree then we'll agree otherwise we will debate and we'll tell you what we think and then the third most important thing is trust but verify okay a lot of people ask me you don't trust me then i i always used to say hey look i work in computational mechanics i do i do a lot of fine element analysis you know how many times you can screw up your 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 input deck and you have to you have to uh, double check triple check all the time because we are humans we make mistakes we just overlook certain things so you can trust somebody but i am say okay but i want to verify it just bring me everything you have i want to check this so when we actually write papers at langley we are put through a ringer by a, a committee before it goes out this committee will tear your paper apart and ask you to justify everything what you say and all the equations are checked so it is just it is trust but verify okay and the fourth one which is uh, uh, which is a direct quote from uh, from a, a man whom i knew for a long time uh, from marshall space flight center he passed away a few years ago uh but he is a, a legend in structural um in structural uh, design test now or test later but you will test that's a direct quote from him you know the later you test it's going to be a lot more expensive that's what he used to say it's going to be four or five times expensive you better you better make plans to test it as soon as soon as you have the hardware ready test now or test later but you will definitely test and the later you test it's going to cost you a, an arm and a leg okay and lot of uh, uh, program managers uh, think that they are superhuman just like uh, dr goel said you know uh they they think that the physics that uh, physics is for the other guys you know we don't need to worry about inertia we don't need to worry about the sonic speed uh, etc they can be ignored they those are not the rules for me physics rules and reality cannot be ignored you in space flight especially you ignore something it will come and bite you at the wrong time just like the murphy law says it will come and bite you at the most inappropriate time okay question and verify all anomalies when we when when you have a uh, a complex system there are always anomalies you may, you want to make sure that you verified all the anomalies and you went through uh, a, a rigorous uh, uh, detail of why the anomaly is happening and uh, you, you you made a thorough investigation of this one and you question and verify all anomalies before you can fly and you shouldn't be flying uh, that's why we have a flight readiness review uh, where all the uh, all the big minds come and you know some some of the guys uh, always shoot uh, to make sure that everything is correct and lastly recognize that all failure scenarios may not be known and are accounted for and therefore you have to expect surprises and a, a, a corollary to this is if in a structure if you cannot predict a failure mode you cannot design against it there are so many examples like the aloha airline uh, when the top of the 740 737 came off okay the the uh, uh, the multi 
multi-site damage was never predicted as a failure mode, and it just happened in in real life. So it will it will catch you by surprise. And also, fortunately, we just lost one life on that day, which we are very fortunate. But that's what I have. I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Um, hi, hello. Yeah, I have a question. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, I was hold wondering on. if. Oh, hold oh, on. Sorry. Um, let's go around the room, ask a question, and then I'm going to rephrase it to make sure that we're all in the same page. So, with that said, um, so so the question the question is, um, did you have to follow your gut instinct sometimes when you're doing this type of analysis? Yes. Uh, can I answer the question? Uh, you know, it is, uh, it's almost an unwritten policy at NASA that we will, we will try to do uh, as much testing as we can, okay? But there are always limitations. Uh, sometimes you cannot just simply test, uh, uh, you know, I can, there are so many examples where uh, we couldn't, we couldn't put a, a uh, for example, we had a, a flow liner, which is an Inconel 718 uh, uh, material, okay, and it is in a in, in a in a flow where liquid hydrogen is flowing. Uh, it, it is a liquid hydrogen then goes to the shuttle's main engines. You know, there was there were cracks developing in the uh, in the Inconel 718, so we we could not measure. We could not put any any instrumentation to be able to measure. Uh, the loads that are coming on there. And therefore these, uh, the people, the loads people came up and gave us the loads. And uh, we are unable to demonstrate safe life with fracture mechanics. Uh, and we went around the bush for, for uh, six, seven, eight months. We couldn't show, we couldn't show flight, flight uh, safety. We could not show that it is safe to fly with these, these cracks were, were growing to uh, a catastrophic uh, length in less than, uh, uh, you know, we are supposed to fly for 500 seconds. They, we are just getting killed in the first 100 seconds. So I, I kept on screaming, saying that your loads are too high, your loads are too high, and nobody knows how to calculate the loads. So we came up with an alternate way of uh, uh, evaluating uh, the, the cracks which are there, which was absolutely wonderful. And uh, one of these days, uh, maybe Dr. Goyle uh, can explain that to you. We have an excellent report on it. Uh, it, is, uh, it is called a replicit method. It's like a chewing gum. You take the chewing gum and then stick it on the, uh, on the, on the flow liner to be, and then take it, take it out and see, see what you got. You know, if, if there are uh, defects on the flow liner, then they will show on your chewing gum. And then you put that in an electron microscope to be able to magnify it intensely. And then we said that we'll, we have to remove all the cracks here because we don't know what the loads are. So we polished this flow liners to mirror finish and got rid of all the defects. And, and then we said, we will, now we are ready to fly. So here is a situation in which you could not do a test. You could not measure anything. I know of value, and and but we still got out of the hole by being very innovative. So that's what you need to do. Okay, thank you. Most welcome. So we have Dr. Raju. We should feel honored that we have him here. So you should take advantage and ask any questions that come to your mind that you think can help you later in your career. Uh, hi, I have a question. Please go ahead. So. I know that good testing often takes time to implement well and make sure everything goes correctly, but I was yes. wondering if you had any advice for engineers who might be working on like a hard deadline and the, how they should first go about testing when they don't have a lot of time to work with. Dr. Ryu. I really cannot answer the question because I'm not a test engineer. You know, I always refer to my, my test guys 
and their advice and then I, I took their advice. But my reaction to that is, well, if you don't have a whole lot of uh, uh, time, then you have to devise a smaller test uh, or, a, or a better analysis to make sure that you are proceeding everything properly. That's what I would do. And secondly, I think one thing that I want to add is that you want to make sure that that you, you is is a, is the deadline um, fictitious or is it really real? Because sometimes program managers will put a deadline that could be fictitious. You want to find out whether people are rushing you to rush you, or whether you need more time. And sometimes, if you present a good case for why you need more time to get it done correctly then you should do so. You should not be suppressed in a company. You should be able to speak up and say, okay, I need more of this information to proceed. And then if, if you couch it and you say, well, you know, listen, I don't have all the data. We're going to proceed to test with a lot of risk. And you just let them know that there's a risk. But uh, you should be very clear with your program management and your technical team what is yes. getting cut by cutting the corners. Does that make sense? Yes, very beautifully said. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. A any other questions around the room? Uh, yeah, I had one question. Um, so what do you normally uh, do if you find yourself in a situation where you can't really use hand calcs um, or if that situation has ever really arised? Well, I, I, well, I don't know. I have never uh, hit that condition. I always came up with something or the other, you know, or me or, or my team, somebody in my team would uh, suggest something which appeared to be uh, out of whack, but uh, turned out to be very, very neat uh, a suggestion. So we would uh, follow the path and see where we get there. You, you will be able to this is coming this is what comes from experience you know you, you you strip off many things and say can i can i treat this as a circular plate with a with a load with a loading on top you know can i calculate the deflection uh, you know i i have i have Demoshenko's plate shells or Demoshenko's elasticity or or uh, or Rourke's formulas you know and, and then make a calculation and get an answer and see if your final element solution is within the ballpark of that number. And it, it actually shows the proper trends, you know, the deflection patterns and so on. So I think it is always possible. You, you have to be, you have to develop the technique yourself. How do you strip away all of the uh, extraneous things and make it simple, you know? So, thank you. Any other questions? Let's take advantage of this time that we have. Uh, sure, I have a question. Um, may or may not be relevant to your experience, but um, if you're doing a uh, structural test on a a complex uh, mechanical assembly, and you're trying to correlate your model um, to the to the test data strain gauges. Um, what type of percent error are you are you kind of looking to get within? And if you're really struggling to correlate that model, um, kind of what steps you take from there? I most of the time, I, what I uh, saw in these big wing tests. Uh, big uh, uh, fuselage tests that they, they do, they're looking for uh, five to 10% and they want to get the trends correctly. Are the trends correct? You know, are, uh, yeah, is the deformation exactly as what we are predicting from the model? Is it correct? You know, uh, so we have, we have, we were able to do that very well within, uh, uh, within five to 10% from the strain gauges. And now, uh, currently, uh, uh, many people, in, in many people are actually, we have been doing this for a long time at Langley. They do a, a full field uh, measurements 
with uh, uh, speckle patterns. They they put a speckle pattern and then they they take the images as the as the structure is deforming. The distance between the speckles uh, gives you a measure of the strain, and uh, that is uh, all automated so that they will be able to uh, demonstrate that with respect with with reference to uh, the contour plots which you get from the um, uh, from the analysis. Uh, we have demonstrated that uh, in this uh, shell buckling uh, uh, tests, which uh, Mark Hilberger did at um, at, uh, uh, at, uh, at NASA Marshall. Uh, they did an analysis beforehand, and then they do a, a speckle pattern. It's, this is a full scale test. This is like a, a 20 feet diameter uh, 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 cylinder, which is being tested. You know, at Marshall has a fantastic test facilities. And so these cylinders are, are coated with uh, speckle patterns uh, beforehand. And then uh, all these, uh, 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 all these uh, uh, exotic uh, measurements are taken uh, and then they're correlated very nicely. So it's possible to do. It is possible to do. We have, uh, uh, we have made very much progress in in, uh, in in full scale tests in in large scale tests and you know and, and measurement techniques and so it's very nice let's take a few more questions only bad news is you guys have to learn many many things <laughs> that's true <laughs> you know uh, but the good news is that there are many opportunities to do whatever you want, you know, so. Yeah, you have a, a full life ahead of you to, to keep yeah. learning. Yeah, I agree. One more question and then uh, we'll thank uh, Raju here. Okay, let's go on a mute and thank uh, Dr. Raju with a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very Thank much for giving me an opportunity to talk to you guys. It's always nice to talk to young people. <laughs> All right. Have have a good uh, night over there in the East Coast. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate See it. Yeah. Thank you. Very nice. Yeah. See you, Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye.